everyone. Good morning. Why? Why are you ruining my shot? Welcome to day nine of vlogging every single day of May. Today we're in Tripoli or Trablos. Uh, we just drove an hour with Claude, who's Yo. joining us today. Really excited to explore the city and dive deep into the hidden gems of Tripoli. Let's go. We are in a really, really, really cool place. Not many people get to come here. It's exclusive, we can't usually go in. And now we're following this black car. Today we're kindly being welcomed by Misbah Ahdab. He's an ex-deputy of the city and he's going to be showing us around along with Omar. You're welcome to the second capital of Lebanon. So basically this park is the fair of Oscar Nimir. He was one of the original modern architects of the world, Brazilian architect. And this project was unfortunately never finished because of the war. Oh, it was completed actually. It was completed and it was supposed to open. The restaurant had all the tools ready really? for opening and then came war. So it was like in the same month it was going to open? It was going to open and then... And the Syrians come in? The Syrians come in because wow. it was the beginning of war. It's been 60 years that this place has been untouched. How many square meters is this whole place? 500,000. The 250,000 are being built and another 250,000 are still empty. Tripoli is the second largest city in Lebanon and it has an incredibly rich history, dating back to at least the 14th century BC, outlasting many different eras and empires. More recently though, the city became home to the International Fair of Tripoli. It was built in the 1960s by Oscar Niemeyer and this massive site included many different exposition buildings and even two theaters. It's so echoey. We are in a massive, massive theater that was never completed. You can whisper and you can hear it everywhere. <laughs> From the outside, it just looks like a tiny little dome. And then you come in and it's just huge. This is probably the best echo I've ever heard of my life. The echo quality is incredible. I can hear Claude whispering right now from the other side. Oscar Niemeyer built this in a way where you can listen to every single detail. It's really magical. It, it would be such a great concert venue or you know, yeah. any type of performance. Yeah. And I know that so many artists in Europe and even in America would be very happy to come and sing in those structures wow. if they had the opportunity to do so because it's totally unique. It's such a shame because it could bring so much to Tripoli. This place needs to be registered as a World Heritage Site seriously, seriously, because it needs to be restored. No one's taking care of this. But before that, it needs to be declared as a national heritage. And that is the problem. The Lebanese government isn't doing anything about this. Omar is flying the drone. <laughs> And Rob is up there. Focusing. And we're gonna try to climb on it because it's round. Ah, this is hard, man. <laughs> he did it! Adam's struggling. <laughs> on the dome, it's beautiful. It's such a huge place in this city. And yet, I never came here before. Offered some gardenias. Mmm, smells so yeah. good. Yeah, the petits insects. What? <laughs> I don't want to inhale them. <laughs> how did Oscar get this concession to build this project? Like, who funded it, and how come it even came from Brazil? It was funded by the Lebanese government. Mm -hmm. The Lebanese government was looking for an economic activity for Tripoli because historically Tripoli used to be the main port in the area. Beirut took over, so they wanted to find another activity. Oscar de Mer at the time was not as famous as he is as now. now. Yeah. So we've been extremely lucky to have Oscar Nemeyer selected and now we have a jewel so whenever there's a decision to work on it to fix it to put it on the international list of uh, world, world heritage, cultural culture. heritage mm -hmm. we have a jewel here yeah trespassing again but on the other side <laughs> the people with us today are so nice and so knowledgeable and so knowledgeable really, really as well knowledgeable. now we're going to the helipad right there say something something <laughs> Going up to the helipad, Ooh. check out the view. Wow. That wow. is so cool. Imagine arriving here on a helicopter, then you climb down and go into the Very concert hall and just scary. enjoy a beautiful <laughs> concert. It's just so, wow. so, such a shame. Such a shame. Alrighty, next destination. We are at an old train station wow. here in Tripoli. This is like a reoccurring theme of visiting abandoned places and train stations. But wow, we've taken it so up a notch because here there are actually abandoned locomotive, locomotive, locomotive. How do you pronounce locomotive in English? Locomotive, locomotive. 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 It's such a weird word to pronounce. The Tripoli railway station used to connect Beirut with Homs in Syria, and it's special because it was also once the terminus of the Orient. Express steam train. Wow. 
gonna try and go up as well. Nice. Wow, this is so cool. And there's a photo shoot happening right behind us. We just met two travelers. He traveled all the way from France to Lebanon by motorcycle. Really Any tip crazy. for travelers? Ah, ah, that's a great tip. <laughs> this is the second traveler we met and he came all the way from Malaysia by motorbike as well. I rode all the way from Malaysia to Lebanon, past 18 countries I think. Took me one and a half years, 40,000 kilometers. And by the way, you entered through Syria to come to Lebanon. Yeah, that's sure. epic. That was a really, really cool experience. Now we're heading to the, the Souks. Souks. All right, hand sanitizer. We've just arrived. No one's wearing masks here. First impressions of the Tripoli Souks. Everyone's so smiley. They're and waving. waving. <laughs> People are staring. They're really curious, but <laughs> we're as curious as them. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Souks are not open yet fully because, first of all, it's a Sunday, but also it is Ramadan time, so they open at night. But I'm really excited because we're going to come back tonight. Look at this. Parts here in candy. <laughs> Mmm, that's so sugary. It's 800 years uh, age and it's called the uh, Burtasi Mosque. Burtasi Mosque. Al Burtasi Mosque. We've just entered the indoor part of the souks and it's so beautiful. This is where they are selling all the textiles and all the clothing. It's really beautiful. Look at this. Look at this architecture. In Beirut, everything's dead. Here, it's full of life. There's food everywhere, clothes everywhere. Beirut is just dead. The spirit of Beirut is, I don't know, it's very different from Trabos. Trabos has potential still. I am now in this beautiful courtyard and over there, there's a little shop where they make traditional handmade, homemade soap. And it smells so, so nice. This little guy here is stacking them all up once they've been chopped up. It's very, very focused. Right now, Flo, Adam and Tare are tasting the specialty of Trablos, one of the multiple specialties, the Moghrabiye. Moghrabiye. It's hot semolina with chickpeas, onions, some spices and pickles as well. Let's taste it. It's really hot, but it's really, really delicious. Well, Omar just told us that Tripoli used to be one of the richest cities in the Middle East because it's a port city, so there was so much commerce because of happening. of the geographic location, because there's a big port here in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. It's near Europe, it's near Turkey, it's near Syria. So, so, many, so much exchange would happen, yes, but no. now? Now it's the poorest city on the Middle East. Sadly to say that. Really sad, yeah. All right, it is almost 7 p.m. There's two things happening right now. So on the one hand, you have people who fast. They have finished work. They're getting together, playing chess or catching up with friends and family. And then there's also the shop owners and restaurants are starting to open because they're going to be feeding the whole city. All right, heading towards the restaurant. And we're driving past the port. So nice. The sun is setting over there. Right now, we just arrived to a restaurant called Silver Shore. And that's where we're going to be doing the iftar with Miss Bach. We're about to have our second ever iftar, although we didn't fast today, but we just arrived and there's a full table laid out. It looks amazing. We're I'm having hungry. Our <laughs> first iftar, actually. Just started with the lentil soup, as always, and a date, of course. And now I'm trying toot for the first time. It's a juice, very juice. Let's taste it. Mm. Very, very good, very fresh. Rice with fish, and Maria's gonna give me some salt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, time for dessert. Carbouche or carbiche? Is that it? One carbouche, two carbiche. <laughs> One carbouche, two carbiche. <laughs> we just finished our meal. It was absolutely delicious. I feel so full and so happy. Really, really grateful. Are you feeling full and happy? Full. <laughs> <laughs> but happy. And tired as well. We ate so, so much. Well. So, so, so much. It was delicious. We also <laughs> nourished ourselves of uh, the wisdom of Miss Bach. Yeah. And we got great conversations with him. It was really insightful. Ooh, I don't know if you can see me. The power just went out. Oh, it's coming back up again. We're walking in the empty streets of Tripoli. It's so quiet. But now we're going to be going back to the souks. It's going to be very different from here. It's going to be hectic and busy. We have arrived in the souks once again. 
It's so crazy because it's just come alive now. It's such a misconception that it's a dangerous city that shouldn't be frequented. And it's such a shame because it's a beautiful city with a lot of heritage, a lot of culture and history. People in Nebelon just live in like little bubbles. Like Maria, who had never been here before, she was telling me that it feels like she's traveling to a different country. She's discovering a completely new place and it's in her own country. It's like an hour away, which is so crazy. It's my first time in Tripoli and I'm actually a Lebanese, but I always thought it was a place really dangerous. I never really thought of coming. I didn't have any reason to come here. And actually, it's really nice. Come to Tripoli. Come to Tripoli. <laughs> so, if you ever think you want to get out of your environment and you're looking for like a change of scenery, just drive an hour away from where you live, and you might be pleasantly surprised. I want to have Mona Lisa on my socks, so I'm buying these. Claude has a weird obsession with like really cool socks. Look at those. He's gonna get some. <laughs> <laughs> Claude was casually buying his socks and the next moment Rob appears out of nowhere with a full-on marching band. <laughs> Tripoli has so much potential, as we've seen today. It hosts historical artifacts of the Byzantine, the Mamluks, and the Ottomans, but today it's completely neglected by the authorities. It is one of the poorest cities in the Mediterranean, with a 70% poverty rate, 60% unemployment, and a primary school dropout rate of over 40%. A massive shame, because it has everything to be one of the most charming places in the Levant. The government abandoned it, and it's become a land of no laws and no order left alone to rot. But somehow the people survived, and that with a really admirable mentality. From my personal experience, Tripoli was very different to other parts of the country I explored. However, like the rest of the country, there was an overwhelming sense of history and hospitality here. And for me, that makes it just as special of a place. And I can't wait to come back and learn more. See you very soon, Tripoli. Really cool, see? Really cool. Yeah. Really cool.